Welcome to the Attic Monologues, Episode 4, Rust. <sighs> Just me today. Bella's gone to her mum's for the weekend. Some family crisis with her cousin? Uncle? I'm not sure, she doesn't really talk about her family much. She seemed a bit... Anyway, might as well keep myself occupied. It's not like I need Bella around to be a functional human being. I can get things done. Productivity. That's my middle name. (sighs) Got an essay due in two weeks. Suppose I could do that. Yeah, no, who am I kidding? That's not getting done until the night before. I could do a monologue, I suppose. Feels a bit weird to do it without Bella here. Maybe. I mean, I could rehearse one or two, at least. And then when I perform them to Bella, they'll be even better than usual. There was that one I was looking at the other day. Here it is. Yasmin Hakim, an exhausted office worker. God, what a... What? Who? Shit. Nix! Hello, hey, sorry, one sec, I need to plug my laptop in. Nix, it's been so long, I've missed your face. What the hell are you wearing? Hang on, there! Hey, Lola, (laughs) I've missed your face too. How are you doing? I'm doing great, and you didn't answer my question. Uh, It's an hoodie, like a blanket hoodie. You look so huggable. (sighs) I would love a hug right now. Oh, is your emotional support goth gone for the weekend? Yes. Yes, she is. But I'm I'm keeping busy with, you know, stuff. Very functional human being right here. What about you? Oh yeah, so busy. Life's very full when you have so many job rejection emails to sift through. Still nothing? Yeah. I mean, I knew it was going to be hard since I have literally nothing on my resume, but still. This is why you go to university. Delay your entry to the real world for at least three years, then do a panic master's, then a panic PhD, and before you know it, you're a middle-aged professor with too many cats. Unlike you, my dream isn't living out a dark academia novel. That's Bella's dream, thank you very much. Of course. How could I forget? The Globe, right? Where Shakespeare did his plays. What's the quote? Uh, All the Globe's a podium. I'm not rising to your bait. You know perfectly well it's all the world's a stage. And... Actually, Shakespeare didn't perform in that globe because the original was pulled down in 1644. The one on the Thames now opened in 1997, and it isn't in the same place. Nerd. Thank you. So, to what do I owe this call? Not that I don't love talking to you, but there's usually a crisis involved. Oh, you know, just... eating dinner. Ah. Well, what is it? My dad made his famous 15-minute fry-up. Cheesy leftover pasta. Oh, I'm so jealous. Can I move in with you and your dad? I'll pay rent and everything. I just need your cooking. You're totally welcome to eat my dinner for me. No, it's great, really. It used to be my fave. It's just... pasta. There's this hopeful look on their faces at dinner these days. Like every bite I take is something they want to take a picture of and put in my baby photo album. And it makes my skin crawl. And I know they're just concerned and I want to want to eat it. So I figured I'd call up the most dazzling, distracting person I know and get them to take my mind off things. I am happy to be your entertainment for the evening. Any day, seriously. What can I do for you today? A gymnastics routine? A dramatic reading of Much Ado About Nothing where I play both Beatrice and Benedict? Well, what were you doing before I called? I was actually about to read a monologue to myself. Oh my god, is this the attic chest stuff you were talking about? Oh my god, you have to read me one. Anyone, I don't care. I missed your last performance because I was in Brazil and I still haven't forgiven myself for it. It was just a uni performance. 
That is not the point, Nix. It's the principle of these things. Besides, I need to get my appearances in before you're performing at the Globe and just looking at your face in person cost me £100. Well, an exclusive performance just for you. I'll come round and sign your arm if you'd like. Mm, I'm good, actually. You're such a fake fan. No, I love you, I swear. Read me a monologue, pretty please. Okay. Are you sitting comfortably? Let me set the scene. Yasmin Hakim, an office worker who's just absolutely exhausted. Amazing. Okay, now no interrupting, kids. I'm not even here. Good. Now let's begin. I'm so tired. Always. Whether I've slept for two hours or ten or none at all during the night or through the day, whether I avoid drinking caffeine or eating cheese before bed, just tired. I must have been born tired, I think. The moment I first opened my eyes, I saw the sky stretching high above everything. So the space between stars and the space between people and the slow blink between my first and last breaths. My mind tried to expand, to fill up that infinity, and spent up a life's worth of energy at once, just considering the impossibility of it all. Exhaustion sank into me, turned my skin and bones and sinew to fragile paper, the leaves of a book left lying open, never shut, bleaching in sunlight and soaked to mush in the rain, so easily torn and ruined and weighed down, even as my mind continues to churn inside it. It's strange. I can be entirely awake and still unable to lift a limb, like my pages have glued together, that my body is made of iron and I've rusted into place. Even keeping my eyes open feels like Sisyphus, heaving his rock uselessly uphill. Yet the moment I close them, energy sparks under my skin and I'm totally incapable of sleep. And the worst thing is, I can't tell anymore whether it's biology or habit. Do I stay awake, getting more and more tired, simply because I can't sleep? Or do I make myself stay awake? Out of habit? Out of fear? I feel like, you know those sci-fi movies where the hero uncovers a robot or an AI from the time before, abandoned, forgotten, malfunctioning, hasn't been turned on in years. It's covered in moss and housing mice in its wires. And the hero, they think it's totally dead. No way it could ever function after this long. But what do you know? Give it a kick and suddenly it shudders to life with that miraculous starting up noise that sounds strangely like a cheap mobile phone ringtone. Its lights stutter slowly, one fixture at a time. Its voice catches every few words, everything jerking and sudden as it remembers how energy flows to every individual wire. I feel like that, because you know, you just know, that it's been awake this whole time. Decades, centuries trapped inside its own head, watching the world end and the rust grow and the mice gnaw out its heart, watching countless other survivors walk past it without a second glance because they have no time for dead things. And it's been screaming all that time. Those robots, they always die 15 minutes later from power failure, burning up their last dregs of energy just to talk to someone just so somebody will say goodbye to them, remember them, care that they stuck it out this long, despite everything. People say things like, oh, I'm dead tired. I think being dead might be less exhausting than whatever this is. 
I work an office job. Don't ask me what we do, I couldn't really tell you. Data entry of some kind, sat at the same desk, same computer, same people around, day in, day out, typing without registering or understanding or having a single coherent thought. I blink and an entire day has slipped through my fingers like so much sand through an hourglass, a life of sped up tape screeching through its reels. But just as often I blink and less than an instant has passed. The afternoon drags by as if dripping with syrup that gathers in growing puddles on the floor until I'm drowning in an ocean of thick gold and every movement I make takes the effort of ten. I can see the drag marks of my limbs in that amber air, feel it folding around me like a blanket. To comfort? No, I don't think so. To suffocate, perhaps. To seep into my mouth, my nose, my eyes, until the world is a choke of burning sugar and sinking sunlight. I wonder, those bugs trapped in amber from back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, are they awake inside too? Are they dead? Are they frozen, screaming, never-ending? Or are they resting, ready to spill forth the moment their imprisonment ends? I think I might be a little jealous. Imagine it, an infinity to rest, but never die. When I was younger, still learning the way exhaustion became me, my teachers told me I was a dreamer, which was all well and good, they said. Creativity is a terrific thing to have in life, they said. But I should keep my imaginings to the night, keep my thoughts on the ground. There is no place in the real world for daydreamers. I didn't know how to tell them that night was no different, even then. Dreaming without sleeping. I'd never fall asleep if I could, because when I did, I didn't dream. I was such an imaginative, dreamy child while awake because all that energy I couldn't, didn't use asleep had to spill over somewhere. I don't really understand how dreams are supposed to work. That night is supposed to be filled with something other than void. Something like escape. There's a strange haze to never dreaming. Like drowning. You slip beneath the black, black waves, drift down into the dark each night. People say sleep should be peaceful. They're lulled by the soft lap of waves against sand, the water rising slowly around them. But I found that falling asleep is far more like being dragged across the sharp rocks of shallows by the cliffs, clawing for a handhold, palms coming away bloody, I gasp for air, cling to anything to keep me afloat, awake, a walk around the block or a fifth cup of coffee pounding in my brain. But eventually, inevitably, the waves will win. It's in my eyes, my mouth, blurring the waking, breathing world to haze. It would be so easy to let go, to give up. And each time, without fail, I'm certain that when the water takes me, I'm not coming back. I'll never see the sunrise again. I'll never feel breath return to my lungs. The last thing I said to my parents, what was it? Was it something good? Something worthy of my final words? Was it I love you or something awful or mundane? Fear rushes up inside me, a whole new ocean drowning from within. And then my fingers slip. The water seizes me, smothers me, crushes me far below into oblivion. The world fades with the certainty that there is nothing, nothing beyond the black. And suddenly I wake.
The sun is still gone outside, but hours have passed. A whole day, unnoticed by the unfeeling husk which kept hold of my consciousness, just barely. To me, it's a mere blink between drowning and surfacing, but an infinite, terrifying chasm. For all I know, I cease to exist. Or the world ceased to exist like a record catching and skipping. Or maybe my heart and lungs shut down for hours before being kicked suddenly back into being. But I'm awake. I didn't sink to the ocean floor to be buried and forgotten among sand and silt. And still... All I can do is fear that the next time I won't be so lucky. That's one of the many reasons I never sleep. Why I'm tired. Why I've forgotten what the sun is supposed to feel like on skin. What the world looks like bathed in light. It's not just being nocturnal or preferring the dark. There's so much more to fear in the dark. But in the dark, at least, there's quiet. In the dark, you're alone. You can hear your heartbeat, hear your breath trip and catch, and know those sounds are your own. There is certainty to being alive in the dark. Outside, I'm sure the world moves on. There's a heartbeat to the distant traffic, the earthbound constellation of a city at my feet. But that complex, twisting beast is a distant thing, far away, separated by some invisible barrier that vanishes with dawn. Dawn. It feels like learning to breathe again. I think the sight of a sunrise is infinitely more beautiful when seen through tired eyes. When you've lived through hours in the dark, alone, surely, but also so, so lonely. It's like hope leeching back into your bones one atom at a time. Your patience, your struggle, it says, was worth it. Even as it burns you, strips you down, exposes you, like a shop window mannequin on display, like an ant under glass. It's hard, deciding which is worse. These days I avoid the sun. It's much easier in winter, I suppose. I go to work when the sky's still dark, go home when the sun's just set, stay awake as long as I can before the waves tug me under for a second that lasts hours. Every day is just the long, thankless chore of dragging my body from one place to another. It moves slowly, mechanical, steady. But if you look too close, you'll see the tremor in its solid fingers. You'll see the glass sheen to its eyes and the rust gathering dark under its eyes. You'll ask it a question, and receive a vacant, stiff nod in reply, no matter the query. You'll go to touch its cold, sun-starved skin and relinquish it immediately, horrified by the bloodless, lifeless thing beneath your fingers. You can only exist in fear for so long. Eventually it becomes average. The feeling rusts, calcifies inside you, becomes a part of you. The idea of a heart that doesn't thunder at the thought of sleep, eyes that don't squint at the thought of light, is alien to me. My body always forgets, at the end, that it survived this. Twenty-five years of this. Statistically, it will survive twenty-five more. But what if? God, what a mood. You think? Absolutely. There's only so much coffee you can drink before you go nuts, before you realise the tiredness is in your bones, not your brain. This girl, Yasmin, she gets it. 
Yasmin thinks she's turning into a robot. Again, what a mood. Aren't we all robots when you think about it? Cogs in the machine, meat in the grinder. I think you're mixing your metaphors there. Don't try and use your book smarts against me. You know I'm right. The day you're right is the day I do a backflip over the Thames. Better limber up then. Anyway, you free tonight? Why? Wow, I'll try not to be offended. I just want to go clubbing and everyone else is busy. So I'm your last choice? Well, I figured you'd be deep in deadlines. But now that I know you aren't, I don't have to feel guilty about dragging you away. Oh, I'm totally deep in deadlines. But when has that ever stopped me? God, I've missed you. Come over in a couple hours? I get to visit the flat. I'm honoured. I know, I know. Bells and I were going to invite you guys over, I swear. But stuff came up. Stuff? Stuff. Adult stuff. You wouldn't understand. Of course, that mysterious other dimension you all live in without me. You're welcome any time. I think I'm good at the kids' table, actually. We get chicken nuggets and afternoon naps. Sounds exactly like university. Without the soul-crushing deadlines. God, you're right. What was I ever thinking? I'll never know. So, how's dinner? It's good. Nearly finished. Mostly finished. Well, finished enough. It's okay, we'll grab cheesy chips on the way back home tonight. If you promise not to abandon me for random jock number 10 halfway through the night, I'll buy you the chips myself. Ooh, tempting. Okay, well, I need to go make my own dinner, so I'm ready to get ready by the time you get here. See you soon? I'll be there. Love you. Love you too. The Attic Monologues are written and produced by Morgan Greensmith. It is directed by Ellen Clohessy and sound designed by Wilkie Morrison and Anna Leclerc. In this episode, you heard the voices of Atlas Morgan as Nix Ryland, Roya Garby as Lola Brodeur. The logo was designed by Ailey Lang. The social media is run by Son Briarwood. Find us on Twitter at Attic Monologues and on Tumblr, Instagram, and Facebook at The Attic Monologues. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a rating and review or tell a friend to listen. Any comments or questions, shoot us a message or email us at theatticmonologues at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening. Episode 5, In the Walls, will be out on Wednesday 28th of June. See you then! Seth! What did you do now? The lack of faith my friends have in me is honestly appalling. Okay then, which guy are we simping for today? No simping for guys. I just got off the phone with Nix. Well, I can see why you'd be simping for them, but I think you'll find that Bella has that covered. I'm not simping for Nix. I want to change my side of our bet. No way! You can't change it now. That's been written in stone since year 11. Wait, why? What What happened? I thought Bella was at her mum's for the weekend anyway. Exactly. God, Seth, it was... If it wasn't heartbreaking, it'd be hilarious. Nix is a great actor about 95% of the time, but they just can't do it when it comes to Bella. It's a disaster. So they haven't done anything? Damn, I really thought them moving in together would kick something off. Hence, the bet. I give them till Christmas. Christmas? No way. If a month hasn't done anything, I'm going to say end of this year. Maybe even end of university. So, changing the terms? It's a deal. I can't wait to be £20 richer. I can't wait to say, I told you so, so loud, something made of glass shatters. I'm going to the flat this evening, so I'll report back on any suspicious activity. For all we know, they've been hooking up in secret. Finally found someone to go clubbing with. Well, have fun. Please, don't drunk call me at 3am. I have an exam tomorrow. No promises. Love you. (sighs) Love you.